Everybody enjoying the conference? Thank you. I, I've enjoyed it. I always, uh, I love learning. I, I, I thought Sean's talk was terrific, and uh, I learned a few new things there. I do a similar talk or on a similar topic, and I thought, oh, that was a good point. I get that down. That was good. So I have the opportunity to kind of close things out. And I thought, well, you know, what would be the best way for me to do that? What, what's the, what approach, uh, you know, may as we conclude our time together? And I thought, you know what? I'm just going to do something simple. I'm just going to tell you a story. It's a true story. It's my story. And it's a story that begins in atheism. Because I concluded at a, at a young age, as a teenager, as a matter of fact, initially, that God does not and cannot exist. I, mean, I thought that God didn't create people, but people created God. Why? Because they were afraid of death. So they came up with this idea of a, of a heaven and this benevolent jelly bean in the sky of a God. And, and I thought they just made all this stuff up to make themselves feel better about dying. That's what I thought. I mean, I thought that the mere concept of an you know, all-loving, all-knowing, all powerful creator of the universe. It was crazy. It was absurd. It wasn't even worth my time to check out. Now, granted, I tend to be a skeptical person. My background's in journalism and law, so you can imagine to put those two things together, we're kind of a jerk, that, skeptic, <laughs> that you get. I was legal editor of the Chicago Tribune, and we used to pride ourselves on our skepticism. You know, we didn't want to accept anybody's word at face value. Well, we always tried to get two sources to confirm a fact before we'd print it in the newspaper. So we actually had a sign in our newsroom that said, if your mother says she loves you, check it out. <laughs> How do you know? Maybe she's lying. Got any proof? Got any data? Got any evidence? Of back? That's the kind of skepticism we had. And you know what? That's a good thing, isn't it, for journalists to be skeptical? You want that, don't you? My problem was my skepticism morphed into cynicism. And it, it spilled over into my spiritual life. And so because I, I had no belief in God, I, I really lacked a moral framework for my life. I'm not saying all atheists are like this. I'm, I'm just saying for me, the most logical conclusion from the idea that, okay, there is no God. You know, that means there is no accountability. Ultimately, there is no afterlife uh, there are no eternal consequences and so. And so my conclusion was the best way to live my life was as a hedonist. Just pursue pleasure. This is all you get in this world. So that was my number one goal in life, to bring maximum pleasure into my life. And so I lived a very immoral and drunken and profane and narcissistic really self-destructive kind of a life. I mean, what was my life? There's a lot of anger inside me, a lot of rage inside me. If you asked me back then, you know, why are you so mad about it? Why the rage? I couldn't have told you, but I know now what it was. I was always after the perfect high. I was always after that ultimate experience of pleasure. And guess what? Everything let me down. Nothing lived up to the hype. So I had a lot of rage. I remember once my, my, my wife was there and we got in an argument and our old daughter was there and I had so much rage, I just blew up. I remember I reared back and boom, I kicked a hole right through our living room wall. And my daughter's crying and my wife's crying. It's like, that's my life. In fact, I'm gonna tell you the ugliest thing about me. Which is when my little daughter, Allison, was just a toddler. If she was alone in the living room, you know, playing with some blocks or toys or whatever, and she would hear me come home from work through the front door, her natural reaction was just to gather her toys and go in her room and shut the door. Is she going to be drunk again? Are you going to be yelling and swearing and, you know, kicking holes in the wall, screaming, you know? At least it's nice and quiet in here. Friends, that is the ugliest truth about me. My wife was kind of in spiritual, neutral, agnostic. I don't know where she was, really. She didn't, couldn't put the spiritual stuff quite together. And, and so one day, we moved into a condo outside Chicago, and the woman downstairs, Linda, was a Christian. And she became best friends with my wife, Leslie. And it was very natural for Linda to talk to Leslie about Jesus. 
because Jesus is such a part of Linda's life. And Leslie wasn't hostile toward this stuff. Nobody had ever told her this stuff before. So she asked questions. She went to church with her. After many months, she came up to me and said, Lee, I made a big decision. I said, what? She said, I've decided to become a follower of Jesus Christ. And I thought, oh, no. I mean, for an atheist, this is like the worst possible news <laughs> you can get. I thought she was going to turn into some sexually repressed prude or something, you know. Spend all her time on skid row serving the poor or something. I didn't sign up for this. This was not part of the original deal. Honestly, first word that went through my mind, divorce. I, I was just going to leave. But I stuck around. And what, what, what really amazed me was in the following months, I began to see positive changes in her character and in her values and the way she related to me and the children. And it was winsome and it was attractive. And so finally one Sunday morning, I'm sleeping off a hangover and she's getting ready to go to church. And, and she looks at me, she says, Lee, why don't you come to church with me today? And I thought, you know what, I'm going to go. Get her out of this cult, you know, that she's involved in. So, so, so I go with her to this church meeting in a movie theater about a mile from my house. And the pastor gets up to preach. And he's a young guy. I don't even think he was shaven yet. Um, <laughs> his name was Bill Hybels. And he gave a talk called Basic Christianity. And I remember sitting there as a skeptic, and it was like one after the other, he was just knocking down my, my misconceptions about the Christian life. And so I remember walking out that day saying two things. Number one, I was still an atheist. He did not convince me that day that God exists. But number two, I realized, if this stuff is true, this has huge implications for my life. You know, duh. So, so I decided that day I'm going to take my legal training, take my journalism training, and investigate, is there any credibility to Christianity or any other world religion? And I launched on what turned out to be a nearly two-year investigation of the evidence. Now, as I began that investigation, one thing became very clear to me very quickly. And that is this. If, if you want to determine, is Christianity true, and therefore every other contrary faith system in the world false? If you want to get to that issue, all you have to really do is answer one question. You know what it is? Did Jesus, or did he not, return from the dead? That's the ball game. Why? Because Jesus, in a variety of different ways, directly and indirectly, made transcendent and messianic and divine claims about himself. He claimed to be the Son of God. At one point, he got up before a group and he said, I and the Father are one. And the word in Greek there for one is not masculine, it's neuter, which means Jesus was not saying, I and the Father are the same person. He was saying, I and the Father are the same thing. We're one in nature. We're one in essence. And how did the audience understand what he was saying? They picked up stones to kill him because they said, you, a mere man, are claiming to be God. So Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, but so what? I could claim that. Paul could claim that. Anybody could claim that. But if Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, died, and then three days later rose from the dead, it's pretty good evidence he's telling the truth. The Apostle Paul recognizes this in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17, where he says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. And so this is the ball game. So here's what I want to do. For the next few minutes, I just want to summarize to you some of the evidence I encountered during my investigation about the resurrection of Jesus. And frankly, I've continued to learn since then because now it's become a lifelong study. Um, and I want to do it using four words that begin with the letter E. That way it's easy to remember, easy to, to, to think about, and so forth. And, and, and I like to use four E's because um, one of my heroes, Dr. Gary Habermas, who's a tremendous resurrection scholar, he uses three E's. So I thought, eh, just to be annoying, I'm going to use four. So, <laughs> so as I, you know, I'm, I'm going to give you the, the, the four E's, but... I want to emphasize, when I did this investigation, I did not give the Bible any special consideration. I didn't consider it to be the Word of God, inerrant, inspired, or special in any way. I do now, but I didn't then. But I had to accept the New Testament for what it undeniably is, which is a set of ancient historical documents. And I knew, just as you can test other ancient writings, whether it's Suetonius or Tacitus or, or Josephus, you, you can take those same historical techniques and apply it to the New Testament to try to determine, is it telling me the truth? So in other words, I just didn't open up the Bible and says, oh, Jesus was resurrected, end of story. I wanted to dig beneath that. How do I know it really happened? So what are the four words that begin with the letter E that summarize the evidence for the resurrection? The first E stands for the word execution. 
You have to have a death, right, before you can have a resurrection. And what I learned as I studied historical evidence for the execution of Jesus Christ, what I learned is there is no dispute in the field over the issue that Jesus was executed under Pontius Pilate. And I don't mean just among evangelical Christians. I'm talking about the wide spectrum of scholarship. Why? Because when you study ancient history, one of the things you learn very quickly is we're lucky if we have one or, or, or maybe two sources to confirm a fact from ancient history. But in the case of the execution of Jesus Christ, we not only have multiple early reports of this right from the first century in the documents that make up the New Testament. But we've got five ancient sources outside the Bible confirming and corroborating his execution. We have Josephus, a first century Jewish historian who worked for the Romans. Tacitus, another early historian. Lucian, Mirabar Serapion, and even the Jewish Talmud admits that Jesus was executed. Friends, this is so well established of an historical fact that you would get laughed out of a major academic institution if you somehow maintain Jesus was not executed. In fact, you could go to the, to the most extreme kind of scholar, spiritually speaking, an atheist New Testament scholar, critical scholar, like Gerd Ludeman of Vanderbilt University. And this is what he will say, quote, Jesus' death as a consequence of crucifixion is indisputable. Indisputable. Now, I don't know how much you're studying about ancient history, but there are very few facts and things from ancient history that a skeptical, atheist, critical historian like a Gerd Ludeman will say is indisputable. One of them is the execution of Jesus Christ. The first E is for execution. Jesus was dead. The second E is my favorite. It stands for the word early. We have early accounts or early reports that Jesus rose from the dead. Why is that important? Because like a lot of skeptics, I thought, well, I got to give you the fact that Jesus was executed. That's one of the best attested events of the ancient world. I, I can't dispute that. But certainly the idea that he rose from the dead is a legend. And I knew it took a long time for legend to develop in the ancient world. So I figured 100, 150, 200 years after the life of Jesus, stories began to develop. Mythologies began to be circulated. Legends began to be developed. And, and people made up stories like the resurrection of Jesus. That's what I thought. But what I learned absolutely, in my view, decimates the claim that the resurrection of Jesus is merely a legend. Follow me on this. We have preserved for us a creed of the earliest church. The very first century, the first Christians would gather around and they would rally around this creed based on facts that they knew to be true. Now the Apostle Paul preserves this creed for us in 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 3. And I'll, I'll tell you what he wrote. He says, For what I received... I passed on to you as of first importance. Stop there. This is rabbinic language. This, this is what a rabbi is saying. I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going to take this sacred tradition, this creed. I'm going to take this, and it's so important. I'm not going to mess with it. I'm not going to change it. I just want to take it, and I want to turn. I want to give it to you. In fact, he said, I already have given it to you. So what does the creed say? That Christ died, why? For our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, the creed says, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at once, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. In other words, there's 500 people he appeared to. If you don't believe us, go talk to them. They're still around. They're still living. You can confirm it. You don't say that unless you're pretty darn sure what you're saying. Then he appeared to James, a skeptic during Jesus' lifetime, then to all the apostles, and last of all, Paul asks, he appeared to me also. Now, so this creed contains the essence of Christianity. Jesus died, why? For our sins, he was buried, he rose on the third day. Here's some eyewitnesses he appeared to, including 500 at once. What's important about this creed is the timeline that Dr. Habermas has developed. As I said, Paul preserves this creed for us in 1 Corinthians. Historically, we know the 1 Corinthians was, was written in about 54 to 55 A.D., Jesus was executed, most likely, in 30 AD, which means that this creed is preserved in the letter Paul wrote within 25 years 
of the death of Jesus. Now, historically, that's very, very impressive. When you consider that the first two biographies of Alexander the Great by Arian and Plutarch were written 400 years after the fact, and they're generally considered reliable. But here we have, within 25 years, Paul writing this letter, and he says, by the way, I already gave this creed to you. What I received, I passed on to you already. So within that 25 years, we have this report that he rose from the dead. But we can go back even earlier than that. Paul had been Saul of Tarsus, a persecutor, a hater, an enemy of Christians. One day, within one to three years after the death of Jesus, he's He's on, his, on the road to Damascus, and, and he's confronted by the risen Christ, and he is transformed into the apostle Paul. He immediately goes into Damascus to meet with some apostles. Now, there are scholars who will say this was most likely the point at which he was given this creed. But most scholars will say, no, most likely it was three years later when Paul went to Jerusalem and met for two weeks with two people specifically named in the creed, Peter and James. And the Greek word that Paul used to describe this meeting, he, he describes it in, in Galatians chapter 1, is hysterese, which means this was an investigative inquiry. So they weren't talking about football or the weather. They were talking about important stuff. What do you know? How do you know? And, and so most scholars would say this was the point at which Paul was most likely given the creed. But either way, it means that within one to six years after the death of Jesus, most likely between 34 and 36 AD, Paul is given this creed. And by that time, it's already in the form of a creed. Therefore, the beliefs that make up that creed go back even earlier, virtually to the cross itself. So the point is, there is no huge time gap between the death of Jesus and the later development of a legend that he rose from the dead. We got a news flash that goes right back to the beginning. In fact, one of the most eminent scholars in this area, James D.G. Dunn, says this. This creed, this tradition, we can be entirely confident was formulated as tradition within months, within months of Jesus' death. Friends, this is historic gold. One of the greatest classical historians who ever lived was A.N. Sherwin White of Oxford. He studied the rate at which legend developed in the ancient world. And he determined that the passage of two generations of time is not even enough for legend to grow up and wipe out a solid core of historical truth. We don't have two generations of time passing here. We got a newsflash that goes right back to the beginning. Friends, it would be unprecedented in the history of the world for a legend to develop that fast and wipe out a solid core of historical truth. And that's not the only early report we've got. We've got others right there from the first century in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, in, in the book of Acts and the other writings of Paul, all of which date back so early that they were circulating during the lifetimes of Jesus' contemporaries who would have been all too happy to point out the errors if they were making this stuff up. Friends, we got an execution. Jesus was dead. We have reports that he rose from the dead that come so immediately after the event, you can't just write them off as saying that they're merely a legend. But that's not all we've got. We've got a third E, stands for the word empty. We have an empty tomb. The historical record tells us that Jesus' body was buried in a tomb belonging to Joseph of Arimathea, a member of the Jewish council. Um, we have good independent historical reasons for believing that's true. It was... It was sealed, Matthew tells us it was, it was guarded, and yet it was discovered empty on that first Easter morning. Now, I could spend the rest of the day talking about all the various strands of historical evidence that established that the tomb of Jesus really was empty, but I'm just going to give you a few facts. That I, to me, this says it all. First is called the Jerusalem factor. The Jerusalem factor. And here's how this goes. This is William Lane Craig, the great defender of Christianity, who, who did the debate I mentioned last night. This, he, he uses this a lot. He points out that the site of Jesus' tomb was known to Christians and non-Christians alike. He said, if it were not empty, it would have been impossible for a movement founded on the idea of the resurrection to, to explode into existence in the very same city where Jesus had been executed. That's a Jerusalem factor. That, that's, that's pretty convincing. But then there's more. There's, there's the criterion of embarrassment. Uh, and I love this one. 
this is how this works. If you're in a story and you're trying to understand, is this document telling me the truth? Like, for instance, about the resurrection, uh, uh, the empty tomb. How do I know it's telling me the truth? One of the tools you use to try to determine that is called the criterion of embarrassment. And what that means is if the writer is saying something that's embarrassing to themselves or hurts their own case, they're probably telling the truth. Why? Because if they were just making this stuff up, if they're just inventing stories, there's no way they would, they would invent something that's going to hurt their own cause or be embarrassing to themselves. So that's called the criterion of embarrassment. Now think about this. Who discovered the tomb of Jesus empty? Women discovered it empty. And yet, we know that in first century Jewish and Roman culture, the testimony of women was not considered credible. They weren't considered to be reliable sources of information. They generally were not even allowed to testify in a court of law. Here's what Josephus says about first century Uh, Roman culture. He says, any evidence which a woman gives is not valid to offer. I'm sorry, that's the Talmud. That's the Jewish Talmud speaking. Here's what Josephus said. But let not the testimony of women be admitted. So here's the issue. If If these documents telling us that the tomb of Jesus is empty says that women discover the tomb empty, there's no way they would have told that and reported that if they were merely making this stuff up because it hurts their case. In fact, Christians were attacked by non-Christians in the second century who said, well, you can't believe this thing about the empty tomb. Women discovered the tomb empty. It hurt their case by reporting that women discovered the tomb. Why would they say that? Because that's apparently what happened and they were committed to telling the truth. So the criterion of embarrassment tells us, you know, if they're going to make this stuff up, they would have said, John discovered the tomb empty, or Peter discovered the tomb empty. Any man discovered the tomb empty. That would have given them credibility. But the fact that they report women discovered in it empty, even though it hurts their cause, apparently they reported it because that's what happened, and they're going to say it and let the chips fall where they may. So that's pretty convincing. But I think this third argument for the empty tomb is the strongest of all. And to me, this is conclusive. And that's this. Even the opponents of Jesus admitted that the tomb of Jesus was empty. This is called enemy attestation. What did the enemies of Jesus say? They're admitting it. How do we know? Because what was the response of the enemies of Jesus when the apostles began declaring that Jesus rose from the dead? What they did not say was, baloney, go look in the tomb yourself, you'll find the body. They didn't say that. What do they say? We know from sources inside and outside the New Testament, what they said was this. Um, The disciples stole the body. What is that? That's a cover story. They're implicitly admitting, yeah, the tomb is empty, but we can explain how it got empty. The disciples stole the body. See what I'm saying? It's like if you're a teacher and a student comes up to you and says, the dog ate my homework. That student is implicitly admitting, I don't have the homework, but I can explain what happened to it. The dog ate it. It's the same thing. They're implicitly admitting the tomb is empty, but we can explain how it got empty. The disciples stole the body. It's a cover story. They're admitting it. Now, it was a bad cover story. Nobody believed it then. Nobody believes it now. Disciples didn't have the motive. They didn't have the means. They didn't have the opportunity. But the important point is, implicit in this cover story is the admission the tomb of Jesus is empty. Friends, the question of history has never been, was the tomb of Jesus empty? The question of history has been, how did it get empty? And you go through the usual list of suspects. The Romans weren't about to steal the body. They wanted Jesus dead. Jewish leaders of the day, they they weren't about to steal the body. They wanted Jesus to stay dead. Disciples weren't about to steal the body. Why? So they could live lives of deprivation and suffering. We have seven ancient sources inside and outside the New Testament confirming that the disciples live lives of suffering and deprivation because of their proclamation that Jesus had risen from the dead. They had no motive for lying about this. I think the best explanation for their willingness to suffer for this proclamation is that the tomb of Jesus really was empty. And it was empty because Jesus rose from the dead. And I think we see that as we go to the fourth word that begins with the letter E, which is the word eyewitnesses. 
Not only was Jesus' tomb discovered empty, but over a period of time, Jesus appears alive in a dozen different instances to more than 515 eyewitnesses, to skeptics and doubters and opponents, as well as to believers, to men and to women, to groups, to individuals, indoors, outdoors. People talked to him, they touched him, they ate with him. I mean, think of this, 515 eyewitnesses. Now, we don't have reports from those particular eyewitnesses. Much of what was written in the first century is lost. But here's what we do have, and it is powerful and persuasive. Remember we said we're lucky if we have one or two sources from ancient history to confirm a fact? Well, get this. For the conviction of the disciples that they encountered the resurrected Jesus we have no fewer than nine ancient sources inside and outside the New Testament confirming and corroborating their conviction that the risen Christ appeared to them. That is an avalanche of historical data. Now, in my book, The Case for the Real Jesus, Dr. Michael Lacona, who's a, uh, got his PhD from the University of Pretoria in South Africa on the resurrection issue, uh, summarizes these nine sources. So I, I just want to give them to you really quickly. So if, if somebody asks, you'll say, well, here are the nine sources that confirm the conviction of the disciples that they encountered the resurrected Jesus. Source number one is the creed we talked about. This creed passes the test of historicity so well that even one of the few Jewish New Testament scholars, Pinchas Lapid, says it may be considered as a statement of eyewitnesses. So first, we have the creed. That confirms their conviction. Secondly, we have Paul's testimony about the disciples. Paul came to know, or first of all, he encountered the risen Jesus, and then he came to personally know many of the disciples, including Peter, James, and John. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 11, regarding the resurrection, that whether it is I or they, this is what we preach. So Paul's saying, I encountered resurrected Jesus. I know these guys. We're saying the same thing. So he's confirming their beliefs. Third, we have the book of Acts. Most scholars, even skeptical scholars, will accept the book of Acts at minimum as being the summary of the early preaching of the Christian church. And what is the central proclamation of the early church? Jesus rose from the dead. In fact, we have Peter just a few weeks after Jesus' execution in the very same city where Jesus was put to death. Gets up and in Acts 2, verse 32, says, God has raised this Jesus to life to which we're all witnesses. And of course, that's the day the 3,000 people said, we know you're telling us the truth, what do we do? They received forgiveness, the church sprang into existence. So Acts confirms the conviction of the apostles that they encountered the resurrected Jesus. Next, we have the four Gospels. And I believe that the four Gospels, um, at minimum to me, report with reliability the essentials of the teachings, miracles, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And I, I think more and more scholars are, uh, have come to the point of respecting the Gospels as historical sources. One of the scholars I interviewed for my book, The Case for the Real Jesus, Dr. Craig Evans, one of the great highly respected scholars in the world on these issues. Produced 50 books. He's spoken at, at, at Oxford, at, at Yale, and Cambridge. This is what he told me. He said, Lee, there's every reason to conclude that the Gospels have fairly and accurately re reported the essential elements of Jesus' teachings, life, death, and resurrection. They're early enough. They're rooted into the right streams that go back to Jesus and the original people. There's continuity. There's proximity, there's verification of certain distinct points with archaeology and other documents, and then there's the inner logic. So here we have the four Gospels, which have a total of nine appearances of the resurrected Jesus. Then we have some evidence from outside the New Testament. If you were to sit under the teachings of Sean McDowell, you just met, if you were to sit under his teachings at Biola University for several years, you would have a good idea of what he believes, right? You'd be able to tell me, yeah, Sean believes this, this, and this. I mean, that's pretty clear. Well, we have some writings by people who sat under the teachings of the very apostles, and they would have a very good idea of what these apostles believed. We have, for instance, Clement. Clement 
uh, was an early church father. He was ordained by Peter. And he wrote a letter in the first century where he said the apostles had, quote, complete certainty caused by the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's confirming that the apostles had certainty based on having encountered the resurrected Jesus. And then there's Polycarp. Polycarp was appointed by John to be Bishop of Smyrna, and he wrote a letter in which he mentions the resurrection no fewer than five times. And this is what he says. Listen to this. This is what he says about Paul and the other apostles. He said, For they did not love the present age, but him who died for our benefit and for our sake was raised by God. So here we have nine ancient sources, inside and outside the New Testament, confirming the conviction of the disciples that they encountered the resurrected Jesus. This is so much historical data that let's go back to the atheist New Testament scholar, Gerd Ludemann. And this is what he was compelled to write based on the power of the evidence. The atheist scholar said, it may be taken not as a possibility, not as even a likelihood. It may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. I don't know if I could have said it better myself. Now, doesn't that raise a question in your mind? Like, why is he still an atheist? You know why? He found the loophole. He was an atheist. He's still an atheist because I, the same reason I was still an atheist at the time. I, we found a loophole. Explains all this away. You know what it is? The disciples didn't encounter the resurrected Jesus. They merely had hallucinations. They merely had visions. Well, there you go. Kind of explains it all away, doesn't it? End of, end of, end of case. Well, wait a second. I, I, I'm a journalist. I try to check things out. So I, I, I want to get to the bottom of stuff. So I went to an expert on the human mind, an expert on visions and hallucinations, a guy who had a PhD in psychology, was a professor of psychology for 20 years at a major Midwestern university. He'd written like 30 books on psychology. He was the president of a national association of psychologists and counselors. So the guy had impeccable credentials. So I laid out all the historical evidence. And I said, now, Dr. Collins, would you not admit to me these disciples did not encounter the resurrected Jesus? They merely had hallucinations. And he looked at me and he said, Lee, that is not possible. I said, what do you mean? You seem pretty sure of yourself. He said, well, I am. I said, well, I don't understand why. He said, Lee, you have to understand something about the nature of hallucinations. He said, you would say the best historical report you've got of the resurrection. The earliest report said he appeared to 500 people at once. I said, yeah. He said, Lee, hallucinations are individual events that happen in individual minds, like dreams. I can't say to you, you know, how'd you like that dream I had last night? It yeah, doesn't work. Or you can't wake up your spouse in the middle of the night and say, honey, honey, wake up, wake up. I'm having a great dream about a vacation in Hawaii. Let's both go back to sleep. We'll have the same dream. We'll save all the airfare. We'll save all the hotel costs. How many would like to be able to do that? I would like to be, yes, I would. Why can't you do it? Why can't you do that? Because dreams are individual events. They happen in individual minds. They don't spread like the common cold. And then Dr. Collins said to me, I'll never forget, he said, Lee, 500 people having the same hallucination at the same time will be a bigger miracle than the resurrection itself. <laughs> and they said, you know, by the way, if these were merely hallucinations, then I assume the body is still in the tomb, right? Oops, the body's gone. Friends, these were not hallucinations. This wasn't something more subtle, like a vision where, where um, people were psychologically primed to see a vision because they missed Jesus so much. They wanted him back so much that they imagined, Peter, don't you see him? Don't you see him over there in the shadows? Oh, yeah, yeah, I think I see him. And they kind of talk each other into it. That doesn't make sense because Saul of Tarsus was not psychologically primed to have a vision of the risen Christ. He was a persecutor of Christians. James, the half-brother of Jesus, was not psychologically primed to have a vision of his, the resurrection. He was a skeptic during his, his brother's lifetime. He was taught that there was one resurrection at the end of time. That was Jewish teaching. And yet, he died as a leader of the church, proclaiming that Jesus had risen from the dead. Why? What happened? The creed tells us Jesus appeared to him also. 
but he wasn't psychologically prime. Friends, these were not visions, wasn't hallucination, wasn't le legend, myth mythology, make-believe, wishful thinking. These were actual appearances of the resurrected Jesus that radically transform the disciples. I mean, they had been, what, cowering and afraid that they were going to get executed. They're hiding. They're, they're despondent and depressed. Their leader is gone. And yet, history undeniably tells us that just a short time later, in the very same city where Jesus had been put to death, these once cowardly disciples are now proclaiming with boldness that Jesus not only claimed to be the Son of God, but he backed it up by returning from the dead. And they were willing to sacrifice and suffer deprivation, proclaiming that message. Why? Because somebody told them it was true? No. Because they learned it in Sunday school? No. Because they read it in a book? No. Because they were there. They were there. Of all the human beings who've ever lived in history, the disciples were in a unique position. They touched him. They talked with him. They ate with them. They were in a position to know the truth. And knowing the truth, they were even willing to die for it. Friends, I studied this stuff for two years of my life. And it all came down to a Sunday afternoon. And I went alone in my room and, and I thought, I gotta, I gotta reach a verdict. I mean, I feel like I've been stuffing my head with all the stuff, it's evidence. I gotta, I, gotta, I gotta reach a conclusion here. So I thought, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna just gonna take a yellow legal pad and just summarize the evidence I've encountered. So I did, I took it, I started writing it out. Page after page after page after page after page after page. And finally I put down my pen and I said, well, wait a second. In light of the avalanche of evidence that points so powerfully toward the truth of Christianity, I realized it would take more faith to maintain my atheism than to become a Christian. <laughs> I'm just saying. And so that's when I reached my verdict. And my personal verdict is that Jesus not only claimed to be the Son of God, but he backed it up by returning from the dead. And then I thought, am I done? Because it was, it was, honestly, it was a little anticlimactic. After time, I thought, that's it? That's it? I mean, that's all there is? I was kind of let down. But then I remembered a Christian friend pointed out a verse to me earlier, John 1, 12. So I got a Bible, I looked it up. It says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. And I noticed something about that verse extract the key words of that verse and it forms an equation of what it means to become a child of God. Believe plus receive equals become. So I did believe, based on the historical data that Jesus you know, claimed to be the Son of God, backed it up by returning from the dead, I got that, but I realized that was not enough. I had to receive. Receive what? Receive this free gift of forgiveness and eternal life that Jesus purchased on the cross when he died as my substitute to pay for all of my sins. And when I would receive this free gift of his grace, then I would become a child of God. So I got on my knees next to my bed. And I poured out a confession of a lifetime of immorality that would absolutely curl your hair. And at that moment, I received complete and total forgiveness through Jesus Christ, and I became a child of God. And my very first thought, I got up off my knees, my very first thought was, um, hey, I should probably tell Leslie this. She might be curious. I, I didn't know. I, fig I figured she'd be interested. So I, I walked out of our room, and I walked down the hallway, and I looked in the kitchen, and there was Leslie standing behind the kitchen sink. I remember I told you about my little girl, Allison. She was standing in front of Leslie. She was almost five years old by then. And she was standing on her tiptoes and stretching out. And for the first time, she was able to touch the faucet. So I walked down the hallway. I looked in the kitchen. Allison said, Daddy, Daddy, look, look. I can touch it. I can reach it. I said, wow, you're really getting big. And she ran off. And I turned to Leslie and I said, honey, that's how I feel. I said, I feel like for the last two years of my life, I've been reaching out and reaching out. and re I just touched Jesus. He is alive. He is resurrected. He is the son of God. I just gave him my life. And she looked at me. And she burst into tears. And she threw her arms around my neck. And she said, you hard-hearted son of a 
Baptist, I've been telling you this for two years, hello. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, she didn't really do that. <laughs> I wish she had done that, because that would have been hilarious. That would have been hilarious. But that's not Leslie. She, she burst into tears and she threw her arms around my neck. She said, oh, honey, I almost gave up on you a thousand times. She said, when I was a new Christian and met some women at church, I told them about you. I said, I don't have any hope for my husband. He is a hard-headed, hard-hearted legal editor of the Chicago Tribune. He will never bend his knee to Jesus Christ. And she said, this one elderly saint put her arm around her shoulder, kind of pulled her aside. She said, oh, Leslie, no one is beyond hope. And she gave her a verse from the Old Testament, Ezekiel 36, 26, that says, moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove from you your heart of stone, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And unbeknownst to me, during that whole two years that I was on that investigative journey, my wife, behind the scenes, was praying that verse for me. And can I tell you what happened? Starting on that Sunday afternoon, now that I was a child of God, and then over time, as I was baptized, as I learned to read the Bible with, with fresh eyes, as I, as I learned to worship, as I learned to pray, as I became part of a church, God began to answer her prayer because my values changed and my morality changed and my character changed and my attitudes and my relationships and my parenting and my marriage. I mean, all these things began to change over time for the good. So much so that my little daughter, Allison, think about that. Here's a little kid, five years old. All she knew the first five years of her life was a dad who was absent, angry, coming home drunk, kicking holes in the wall. That was her entire experience for the first five years of her life. But starting on that Sunday afternoon, you know what she did? She watched. Something's going on with dad. Something's happening with dad. And she listened and she observed. Something's going on. And she watched. And it took about five or six months. And then one Sunday morning, she came up first to her Sunday school teacher and then to Leslie. You know what she said? I want God to do for me what he's done for daddy. And at age five, my little girl gave her life to Jesus Christ. And today she's... Today she's... She's married to a graduate of the master's degree program in apologetics at Biola University. <laughs> Together they write children's books about God. She is the mother of two of my four precious grandchildren. And we are the best of friends. Same thing with my son. My son saw the difference God was making in our family at a young age and he came to faith and he, he took an academic route. He got an undergraduate degree in biblical studies then he went to Biola, to Talbot Seminary at Biola University, got his master's degree in philosophy of religion. Then he got another master's degree from Biola in New Testament. And then a couple years ago, after many years of research and study, he was awarded his PhD in theology from the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. And now you know what he does? Now he's a professor at a major university where he teaches young people about Jesus Christ. Because he said, Dad, there's a whole generation out there, you know, my generation, they don't get it yet. They don't understand. This isn't based on wishful thinking and, and, and legend and mythology. This is based on a solid foundation of historical truth. And I said, son, you've got your PhD now. You go tell your generation. Friends, God changed my life. He changed my son. He changed my daughter. He changed my wife. And we just recently celebrated our 41st wedding anniversary together. So that's, that's my story. And that's the, you know, I hope those four E's can be helpful as a way to kind of keep in mind as a framework for talking about the resurrection and so. But here's what I want to end with. How many of you attend this church? Yeah, lots of you. It's a great church. I had a wonderful time. Here's what I want to say to you. I've got an assignment for you. I'm preaching at this church this weekend, starting six o'clock today and then twice tomorrow morning and Sunday night. And I'm gonna do a streamlined version of what you just heard. I'm gonna tell my story, I'm gonna hit the four E's in a, in a quicker way to an audience that's not quite attuned as you are to apologetic stuff. But it's gonna be an evangelistic message. And at the end, 
I'm going to say, if you're not ready to receive Christ, if you don't yet believe, do what I did and check it out. And we'll encourage those people to do that. I'm going to say, some of you believe, but you've never received. And I'm going to offer a prayer of salvation for those people. So here's your assignment. If this is your church, get on the phone this afternoon. Invite people in your sphere of relationship. Say, hey, you know, um, I know you've got some questions about God. I know you're kind of skeptical about this stuff. I just, I just heard from a guy. You know, he was an atheist. He didn't believe this stuff either. He's going to tell his story and, and why he changed his mind. Would you be interested in coming? So your job is to get people here, to get them in the room so that we can, you know, see what God might do and maybe change the eternal destinations of many of them. So that's your assignment. And uh, I'm, I've been praying for a long time that God would show up in a big way this weekend at the services here at this church. I hope you're praying about it too. Let's, let's make it, let's make it an eternal turning point for these people. Let me, let me just pray. Thank you. Let me just pray. Father, I thank you for this group and, and uh, their commitment to learning and, and, and growing together. And uh, we thank you for this conference and Craig Hazen and Biola and, and, and all the resources they poured into making this happen. We thank you for that. But we pray for those yet to come to faith who may be willing to come this afternoon or tomorrow to hear a story, a story that we pray by your spirit you would use to lead them into your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.